For any of you who may be used to a three-minute homily, you're in trouble. When Fred Craddock, a preacher, was baptized, he was 14 years old. He knew that the minister was saying a lot of wonderful things about being buried with Christ. But Fred was thinking, do I hold the handkerchief? Does he? I wonder if the water's cold. And I bet it's deep, too. Fred was having all these other thoughts, and the minister was saying, you're buried with Christ. And it seems that often we, kids and adults alike, learn things afterwards in reflection and memory, sometimes more than in the formal moment of teaching. Fred told of going back to a town where he had pastored years before to do a friend's funeral. After most everyone had left, he met up with his friend's daughter, who had been the worst 13-year-old ever. When he left that church, Fred believed that if there was anyone who hadn't heard a word he'd said, it was Catherine. Catherine, now in her late 30s, sat down with Fred, who expressed her condo his condolences, knowing she'd been very close to her dad. She said that when she got news of her father's death, she had scrambled for something to hang on to. And what she remembered was something from a sermon Fred had preached on the meaning of the Lord's Supper when she was 13 years old. She told him what that something was. All those years before, Fred th thought Catherine hadn't heard. You just never know. The title of this sermon, Kids, What Are You Gonna Do?, could be taken two ways, directed toward kids or toward adults. Well, it's meant for both. I figure it's got all of us covered. And although I have not been a biological parent, I've been a teacher, grade, junior, and high school, worked for 17 years in a summer camp, and was a nanny. Oh, and once upon a time, I was a kid. So whether you fall into the kid or parent category, this sermon is for you. And if you're a non-parent adult, this sermon's for you. It's for all of us in this church family. This week, I saw the first of class of 2024 graduating senior signs that seem to sprout each spring on people's lawns. And I've been seeing social media posts for college decisions. It struck me, as it does each year, that a number of our teenagers are going to leave for college this summer, or work, or perhaps the military. And I will miss you. Then I began to think about the fact that many of them will be somewhere else than here to go to school and fulfill those plans, maybe even out of state. And I'm wondering about you who are leaving. How will you remember your time here at Narberth? And how will it inform your life from now on? And then I found myself thinking about how it might feel to be a parent contemplating your child going and what you might be remembering of your family life. These leaving moments in life are incredible opportunities, both for anticipating and for remembering. I thought about what it was like when one of my boys from nanny days went off to college in Kansas. He messed up pretty badly, and his first year was very nearly his only year. I remembered how he called me in the middle of the night and asked if I thought there was any hope for him or if he was a lost cause. I told him that when he was little, I prayed that the Lord would bless him and protect him from any bad people he might meet and that he would grow to be the person God had created him to be. But that since he had been a teenager, I had added the prayer that God would also protect him from himself as much if not more so than from the bad people. Do you really pray that? Every day. Don't stop, Deb. Keep it up. I'm probably more of a danger to myself because I make so many dumb choices. Do you think it's too late for me? I could have jumped all over him for any number of things he had done and for which he was now realizing the consequences. But I chose to tell him that God loved him 
and had blessed him with a good mind, and that if he worked hard, he'd find out what he was capable of. I believed he had the ability to succeed, but if he continued to make poor choices about classes and lifestyle, he might lose the ability and so the possibility to pursue his best dreams. I believe that if he wanted to reverse the trend of poor choices, then he could regain the trust of his family and the university and see what good come out, could come out of it. The long and the short of that story is that just over 20 years ago, I had the privilege and joy of watching Morgan walk across the stage at his law school graduation. 16 years ago, I participated in his wedding and had been watching as he and his wife raised their children, the eldest of whom just became a teenager. My prayers for him have morphed over the years, that he and his family would meet good Christians where they live, that they'd be drawn to the Lord as God's people share his love with them, all four of them, and that Morgan would bless others through his practice of law. My prayers may have expanded, but they've always been that God would reveal himself to Morgan and his family in ways they can perceive and receive, drawing them each and all further into the orbit of God's love, which we know most fully in his son, Jesus, and experience daily in the context of Christian community. Our call to worship told us that God is the only God we are to love with all of who we are. The things that God says are important are meant to be internalized, written on our hearts, part of us, not rules imposed by parents or the church or the school we go to or our peers. And when we live according to what God says is important, people around us will notice, our family, friends, coworkers, and especially our kids. And when we live with people, they know us. If we have a different set of values, language, and behavior, depending on the setting, our kids notice and they remember. So Deuteronomy tells us to make sure the important things are those which, on which our daily lives are founded. They're not kept on a shelf until Sunday or when someone we perceive as spiritual or religious is around. Deuteronomy 6 tells us, that the important things are to be the normal things of daily life. It's not so tough to remember the things we think about and talk about and do daily. Over time, if we practice certain things, they become our habit. And when we make choices, we'll look inside and find the things we've practiced written on our hearts. Parents, when I ask, kids, what are you going to do? I'm suggesting that you model your highest hopes for your kids by living the wisdom of Deuteronomy 6. And to any kids in the room right now or online later, I hope, I hope, I hope, I say, kids, what are you going to do? I'm suggesting that you practice or begin to practice those things that God says are most important. Things like remembering who God is, what God has done, and God's tremendous love, doing what is right, and extending mercy, not just expecting it for yourself. Because what you practice today is an investment in the person, the adult you are becoming later on. Whatever our age, Let's think about who and how we want to be in five to 10 years. Now is not too soon to begin practicing those things that characterize the person you and I would like to be later on. I want to stop there just for a second because maybe some of you are thinking, Pastor Debbie, what planet do you live on? You have no idea what fun is. And besides, when I'm not here at church or at home, Who's going to know? I can do what I want, and nothing you or anyone else says can change that. Friends of any age, I can only be the person God created me to be and take responsibility for my attitudes, actions, and words. 
I am not the Presbyterian perfection police. I can encourage and challenge you. I can pray and hope for you, not because this is what I'm paid to do, but because I really believe the stuff we read in Deuteronomy 6. And if I love you, and I do, I will want God's best for you. And not only talk about it, but try to be an example, imperfect as I am, of someone who practices living according to what God says is important. Only you can decide whether to do the same. And I may never know if you choose differently. But in the end, none of us will stand before any of the other of us, not our parents, not our peers, and give an account of how we, what we have dedicated our life to. We're going to stand before God, who created us, who knows and loves us best, and to whom we are ultimately responsible and accountable. And if we practice each day, we'll find that the things we hold as most important become part of normal life. They'll be written on our hearts. And I hope that when you look at your parents, you who are children, and other adults who say they love God, you will see them practicing this too. And parents, what if you haven't always modeled what you want to teach your kids? What if you've messed up? What if you've made mistakes in life and your kids know about them? What if you had more than one set of values and behavior? One for public, one for private, one for adults, one for kids. What if you haven't always been full of hope? What if you haven't lived up to what you'd hoped for yourself? If you haven't been perfect, what hope is there for your children? Well, there's no hope for them to be perfect either, but that's true for all of us. Younger and older, single and married, parents and children, we all need to be honest about who we are, about who God is. And we all need to practice those things God says. Are important. The Christian life isn't about being perfect. It's about recognizing our need for God and for each other. Every day, I added that. As we keep our eyes on Jesus, choosing to live in ways consistent with his example, it's about turning away from the sin in our lives, asking God's forgiveness, the forgiveness of those around us, and humbly recommitting ourselves to faithfulness to the Lord. The Christian life, whatever our past has been, is about entrusting ourselves today to the kind care and guidance of God, who by his powerful spirit will enable us to grow. We call this discipleship. The Christian life means understanding that we take our cues from the Lord and from scripture as we make decisions that affect life in large and small ways. Why do we do this? Because we believe that the God who rescued his people from slavery in Egypt will rescue us from whatever enslaves us. Sometimes things we've chosen, sometimes things that have been imposed on us by others, if we entrust ourselves to God. So whether you're going off to college or jobs or something else, whether we're watching them go, Whatever your home situation, good, bad, indifferent, you need to remember that if you are a Christian, your family includes us, your Christian brothers and sisters. We all are part of God's equation for growth, encouragement, and challenge. Sometimes our own parents aren't able or aren't there. Sometimes they need some help. And members of the larger church family can help provide what is needed. Those who are younger, whether physically or spiritually or emotionally, can be mentored and guided by church folk who are more mature. Read that older. When I was growing up, I was the pastor's kid. You'd think I wouldn't need to look to anyone besides my parents, whom I loved and, while not perfect, practiced living by what God says is important. But ever since I was a kid, I thought I had a really big church family because of church. And I watched the adults in church to see what's really true 
about this Christian life business. And believe me, I watched closely. Growing up in church, I watched people practice living like Jesus, and I watched them mess up. I watched them face illness and death, sometimes unexpected. I watched them when they weren't sure what to do next, when they were convinced about what to do, and I saw them when they experienced really bad things and really good things. I saw that although they were not perfect, they mostly seemed focused on what God says is important. And they were trying to choose attitudes, actions, and words that lined up with that. And I saw time after time that when someone needed help, others in the church family were there, often very quietly for them. And I remember that when I left high school at the tender age of 16, I, along with all the normal kids who were actually graduating, received a quilt that the church women had made. Each quilt was cut, sewn, and tied during the preceding year, often with scraps of cloth from clothes of our growing up years. My quilt was made in a hurry because I left high school after my junior year. It wasn't because the women had so much free time or because it was a New England thing to do that those quilts were made. The women made those quilts so that we remember where we came from, who loved us and prayed for us, so that no matter where we went, no matter how far we strayed, we would have this tangible reminder of home and our church family. I remember not only because they told us so in a speech in church, but because I still have the quilt, which I forgot in my office, you can come visit it. Not all of us who grew up in that church family chose to follow God's leading after high school. Some of us broke our parents' hearts and our own as we decided to live life on our own terms instead of God's. We tried to convince ourselves that the things our parents and other church members didn't know about our lives didn't really matter. Um, but they did, even if it was only to give us regrets and a sense of hypocrisy whenever we came home or later when talking or not talking with our own kids about living good and godly lives. It's funny, though. Everyone I know from Merrimack Street Baptist Church still has their quilt, and most, if not all of us, would tell you that our quilt did indeed remind us of who we are in God's eyes and in the eyes of our home church family. The quilt reminded us that we were part of a great heritage of faith, lived out in ordinary life, not just on Sundays. The quilt reminded us that when we were far from our parents and church family's watchful gaze, we were never out of sight of the Lord, whom we had promised to live for, and with whom, and live with when we first believed. And the quilt reminded us where home was. Most, if not all of us, are again or still plugged in Christians, active in congregations, sharing our faith with kids and grandkids, as well as with adults. And we've told them about those quilts. We don't have a tradition of quilts for high school graduates here at Narberth. The quilts made here are given to kids and adults who are receiving treatment for cancer. But quilts are just one way to remind people of the prayers love and hopes of God's people for them. When I left high school, I also had the Bible I was given when I entered third grade, signed by the Sunday school superintendent at Stratford Baptist Church. And beyond the Bible and the quilt, I had my memories of Bible stories, junior choir, youth group, retreats, VBS, Sunday school, two services on Sunday morning, getting in trouble in those services and being scolded for it by someone grown up. Sunday evening service, often food. Weddings, babies, funerals, hymn sings, covered dish suppers. I remember Wednesday night Bible study and prayer meeting where I learned a lot about studying the Bible and prayer as I watched those things being practiced. I remember baptismal classes where I was nine years old in a class of adults but we were all starting out together as new believers. I could go on and on. It boils down to this. I am a Christian by God's grace, 
grace that was shown to me primarily by ordinary, imperfect people, including my parents, who had committed their lives to the Lord, practiced living according to what God says is important, and who shared themselves with me when I was a frisky kid growing up. I remember and try to do the same. One of my best friends growing up is also a Christian, but not because her home was a place where she saw God's love and care. Actually, she experienced violence and pain at the hands of her father and rejection from her mother, who was overwhelmed. My friend Susan would tell you that she's a Christian and now a pastor because she and her siblings found family in the church where instead of pain and brokenness, they experienced God's life-giving love because God's family shared it with them. Susan's biological family broke apart amidst great turmoil, and it seemed nothing good could come of it. But Susan never forgot that God, unlike her earthly parents, is always kind and good, and had shown that kindness and goodness first through bringing her family to Merrimack Street Baptist Church and then to my family. Through the years, Susan and other young people God brought to being part of the church family became members of my family as my parents opened their hearts and our home to those teens whose own homes were troubled. And besides having brothers and sisters of every shape and size and color, I learned that whatever your family situation, church is always meant to be your extended family. Two observations and we're done. After 9-11, Bruce, Strings, Bruce Springsteen and the E Street Band put out a new album, which I still love to listen to. I was surprised by some of the words because they were really familiar to me from a very different context. In his tribute to the firefighters at Ground Zero on that day, the chorus says, into the fire, may their strength give us strength, may their faith give us faith, may their hope give us hope, may their love give us love. Straight out of 1 Corinthians 13. Hmm, it's rock music, but it's got a great message. Second, 90-year-old Betty Shedden became a part of our congregation in 2001. In 1940, Betty found herself single with a two-year-old when her 28-year-old husband died suddenly. What hope was there for her or her son? In that terrible reality, Betty remembered what God says is important, and she lived the next 62 years as a woman of faith, hope, love, joy, and strength. As I stood at her grave in 2002 with her son John and his wife Judy, we remembered to turn to scripture, to turn to the Lord in prayer, and we remembered Betty. When he heard that his grandmother had died, her youngest grandson, then a student at the University of Virginia, told his parents, if there's one thing you could say about grandmom, is that she really lived her faith. She was a real Christian, and I want to live like she did. It was the end of a life, but a great and enduring message. As each new generation comes along, we who are older in the faith get to pass along the gift of love and faith we've received. We bring our children to the Lord for him to bless them. We teach them what God says is most important in life. We practice living in ways that show our children that what we say we believe about God's love and grace is written on our hearts. We admit it when we fail. We ask for forgiveness and live in it. We pray for our children, and when they set out after high school, we trust that they will remember who they are, where they come from. We pray that what they practice each day reflects God's heart and already is shaping who they will be in the days and years to come. Most of all, 
We pray that God, who begins a good work in each of us, when we entrust ourselves to him in faith, love, and obedience, will not abandon the project in us or in our kids, but is committed for the long haul and will provide everything we need to be his people. Today is Preschool Sunday. I'm thankful for the many parents who entrust their little ones to the kind care of the preschool staff and for the daily living out of what I'm talking about as they're all together in the classrooms, on the sidewalk, in the gym, indoors and out, as the teachers and staff give the children love, hope, and faith lessons to remember, sharing themselves with the children along with everything else they share. From our little ones right through high school, Danielle Kaufman, Claire Woods, and the many who join them in ministry to our children and youth are the face of our commitment to them, evidence in human form that they are valued and loved by God and by us. And then there are the college age and 20-somethings. How do they know that they matter to God and to us? We've always had individuals who pray and reach out, as do our deacons. But in order to have more consistent contact with all our post-high school young adults, we need to know where they are. And so on behalf of our deacons, on behalf of all of us, Rashmi Vias and Lalitha Naveen, both of whom are standing up even now. Where are you? Okay, there's Lalitha. Where is Rashmi? Oh, here's Rashmi. Take a look, take a picture. Okay, both of them have daughters, and you can sit down. Both of them have daughters in college, and they're asking you who are parents of young adults to respond to the very brief survey that will soon be in your email feed, and I do mean check your spam folder. And you can also just talk to them. Help us love your children throughout life. So kids, whether here or somewhere else, Continue to practice living in ways that show you are a child of God. And don't forget that wherever you go in life, while your family at Narberth will be praying for you, there will also be a branch of God's family in those new places you go, where you can be yourself for God and with his people. And to the rest of us, we too need to remember that often children come to know God's great love for them because they will have experienced it from people, and we hope those people, parents, and this church family will be the first and most consistent in showing them God's love. We need to remember that we don't need to be perfect, just willing. And the Lord who welcomed and blessed the children brought to him so long ago welcomes us and will bless us with strength, faith, hope, and love as we share these things and ourselves with the children God brings. Amen.